everybody. Welcome to another adventure with From Adversity to Awakening, Transforming Hardships into Greater Spiritual Connection and Joy. My name is Peggy O'Neill, and I am your host today. And I'm here with the lovely Kirsty Spragan. Kirsty's been a friend of mine for, I don't know, 15, 20 years, 15, like 15 years now. She's from Australia. She's an awesome person. She's coming to us live from Mexico City. And she is a bit of a world globe traveler. She has been all over the world. Anyway, I'll tell you more a little bit about her. But hi, Kirsty. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Peggy. Great to be here. Thank you, sweetie. So uh, I first met Kirsty in the National Speakers Association when we both were uh, speakers. And she came from Australia and ended up coming to stay with my husband and I for some time. And I have, we've stayed close through all these years. And she transitioned, she had some, she's going to tell you today about some challenges that have come in her life. And she transitioned uh, from being a corporate speaker. And actually prior to that, she was living in Australia and as a young person was a very highly accomplished and awarded real estate agent. And she came from that background and decided one day, oh, I'm going to become a motivational speaker. And that she did. And she was like, amazingly successful at it. And then um, some adversity came and she is now healing through all of that and has brought her new skills as a modern medicine woman to her clients that she serves both in groups and one-on-one. -on -one. So uh, she's living in Mexico City now. She's an inspiration to all who want to experience expansion and uh, adventure in life. She's an amazing mentor for all of that and for deep and real healing, especially around trauma. This is her specialty. Anything else you would want to add to that, Kirsty? No, spot on. Okay, good. All right. So um, let's just dive in. And why don't you share with us about the, your life's adversity, Kirsty. I know there's been two general segments of it. Yeah. I mean, I guess on the professional side, I was never one to take the easy path. So there was a lot of adversity in terms of, you know, uh, I hit the top of my career in Australia. I could have lived a comfortable life and probably retired, um, but really felt called to something bigger um, on a higher, higher level. You know, I guess uh, Back then, I wouldn't have understood that my guides were already speaking to me and directing me. Um, so I left Australia, moved to the US, um, as you said, stayed with you at some points of that journey. And there was a lot of adversity in that. You know, when you move away from everything you've known in your comfort zone, your family, your friends, your work that ties to income, and you're willing to take a huge bet on yourself, really. Really? There's many moments of being in fetal position uh, in LA that I remember. And then on the other side is really the journey of healing and awakening for me, which was connected to trauma. I had some repressed memories of sexual abuse come up uh, later in my life, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, I did a TED talk many years ago, a TEDx on having herpes around shame and secrets and so a big part of my adversity in life has been around healing myself from the past. Beautiful. So that's a lot of adversity. I mean, a, a, a lot. And um, I think you'll share with us a little bit more about it. I forgot to tell people that you, not only are you modern day business, I mean, sorry, medicine woman with clients and small groups, but you're also bringing this work into corporate, which is really awesome and helping people to retrieve their somatic sense and their sense of well-being, you know, checking into their sense of well-being and recognizing that they can make choices and all of that good stuff. Right. And I think that that for me even is a form of adversity. I see so many people who want to shift in their career in some way and you know, it, it shift the mask, like being on stage, you know, when you've spent decades being trained by the top in your field and you've put them, you know, as a guru status in a way, 
to then trust yourself to take that mask off. And for me, that looked like instead of the rah-rah motivational speaker, it was to come into my more spiritual self and bring that into those rooms to sit in ceremony, in sacred ritual, to take my shoes off maybe and sit and meditate with them, to drop them into altered states of consciousness. That takes a lot of courage to get past yourself and all those preconceived ideas that you've spent decades living in in terms of the culture and the society and the places that you are and everything you've been taught is the right path to success. Um, so, I, you know, I think of it as like Lady Gaga taking the mask off and the meat <laughs> suit when she became more her authentic self. It's like it's a very courageous journey that I think ties into adversity as well. Well, I think we could say that courage is one of your superpowers, Kirsty. I <laughs> think we could say that without any doubt whatsoever, because you have again and again with your corporate career at the beginning, before you were 35, even you had achieved great heights. And then you moved to America and decided you're going to start this whole new career with a whole new group of people who don't even know you. And now you're taking some very vulnerable work and very things that have been classified as sort of, we don't talk about it. We don't go there, even taboo. And you're bringing, woo -woo. and woo woo. And you're bringing this to um, people and presenting them with, if you really want to get better, let's start with the core and the source of the problem, not with the symptoms. So love that. Okay, so that's my add-on. I, <laughs> I just want to point that out. So tell us a little bit about how did the when the memory started to come up for you, how did how did it impact your life to recognize that you had had undergone such trauma? Oof. I think the first thing is, you know, it was like being in a car accident uh, that couldn't be seen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there was it, physically, if someone was in a car accident, you'd go, oh, my God, like, we need to take care of them. We need to bandage them. We need, there's maybe months or a year of recovery, depending on the level of damage. And this was like a car accident in my mind. You know, my psyche was collapsing, um, my identity as I knew it, everything that I held true. Um, you think that maybe you're crazy. Like, how could I have blocked out something so substantially, severely, you know, completely. And as I've gone down this path, I now have friends who I didn't know had had the same experience of repressing out um, mm -hmm. abuse in their own life and many memories of different kinds until 30, 40, 50 um, which just astounded me. So, yeah, for me, the the main impact in the beginning was this feeling of everything collapsing. Uh -huh. um, and and I kind of and got doubting and doubting yourself, probably. Like yeah. that, and then and then I would imagine the self doubt is like systemic. It probably went into, well, can I really do this? Can I really do that? I think you know it. It, it three things kind of happen at once. You know, one, I had this collapsing of my nervous system and my body and my mind and, and was just not, uh, didn't have any bandwidth for anything else, wasn't capable of being on stage at that point, like pulled back from everything, which then lane two was a ego death. You know, all I had ever been was my success. And I then recognized that a lot of that was driven by wanting to show to the bullies, like, well, I'll show you who I am. And so a lot of the success identity, so ego was sort of stripped away in that time by not being on stage and not working. And then at the same time, lane three was happening. I started having a massive spiritual awakening, kundalini activations, channeling, speaking to guides, connecting to God. Connecting. <laughs> so that, I think I thought I was more crazy for that than the memories, you know, there was ah. all three happening at once. But honestly, I don't know if I would have got through it without that deep connection to the communing with the divine source, God, the universe, whatever you want to call it, was so magical and so present in that time that I think it really helped me to be able to 
um, handle the magnitude of the trauma that was coming into my field. Well, that is an incredibly beautiful articulation of that process that happens when the adversities really, you know, sort of slams us in the face is these three steps. And um, nobody I've interviewed so far has articulated it quite so succinctly and beautifully and clearly. Thank you for that. And I am particularly, because this is called From Adversity to Awakening, I'm particularly interested. Can you tell us a little bit about how the adversity helped you to have this spiritual awakening, this connection with spirit, God, whatever you call it? I, I think the first way was there, there was no way of just pushing through this in the way that I had maybe with my success learned to do 14 hours a day, seven days a week, hustle. This was such, a, you know, I'd never suffered depression. I'd never been suicidal. I'd never really had anxiety in my life. And I think that was partly because I my way of coping through life had been to put on the mask, to entertain, to perform, to get on stage, to go, 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 go. There was no space for any feelings, any quietness. I was also at different times in my life numbing through food, sex, drugs, alcohol. And so this was, you know, it, I believe that, you know, in speaking to a lot of my clients with trauma now, I see that there is often a divine timing in when something surfaces in their life when they're ready and prepared to deal with whether it's the grieving process or the healing process or revisiting childhood memories. And so it surfaces, they'll start having nightmares, they'll start, you know, all, all of a sudden something will shift in their life and they'll go into this car accident moment of like complete yes. collapse. Yes. And for me, that was kind of the first step of like, oh, you can't push through this. You need to honor your body. And so the spiritual connection to that is that whether it was through meditation, whether it was through cold plunging, whether it was through um, moon dances in Mexico or tennis style sweat lodges, I had to learn for the first time in my life to that I couldn't push through something, that I had to sit with the feelings and be with the feelings sometimes for months and weeks on ends at different times. And I think that our society might label that as depression or anxiety and, or a million other things. Right, but right, right, right. It was a dark night of the soul. And I was lucky in that I was away from mainstream society in the US where that may have happened and I'd be put on medication. And I was, I honored myself by taking myself out of work and going, and I recognize that I'm fortunate that I could afford to do that. And there's many people who cannot. Um, so I, you know, really did step back and say, I cannot be on stage like this in this moment. I need to work with these feelings. But I also remember kind of almost screaming to the universe, to God at some moment, like, this better be done in six months. And, <laughs> exactly. and it was a six-year <laughs> process. And, you know, it changed over the years and I went in and out of being able to work at different times. But I kind of, it was like I'd do one for a client and one for me. I'd do a week for them and a week for me. I'd do a retreat for a client. Then I'd go into my own healing retreat. And so there was this dance over the next six years where I really balanced honoring myself and surrendering that I wasn't done yet as much as I kept thinking oh this has got to be the last bit then there'd be another piece and it'd be another piece um and so I well, think that's that how I've, I've experienced it as well it just keeps it keeps unraveling and it keeps unraveling and as it does you know, what resolves inside brings greater peace. What resolves inside brings greater opening and inner expansion and all of that. So and, and I, yeah. I just would say to people, like, whether it's the loss of a loved one, a child, grief, whether it's emotions from the past coming up to be dealt with when you're finally sober, for example, you know, that often comes up for people. Yes. Yes. Or just at this right moment, my... 
greatest advice would be, be like be willing to feel the feelings and that means taking time to step back not being as busy like sometimes being in fetal position um finding the modalities that work for them in that moment in time like we are so intuitive our our soul our guides like if we deeply listen we have the answers beautiful so beautiful Kirsty. thank you and i and i just want to acknowledge you when you were talking about sort of uh the dance between being able to work and being able to self-care and heal and yeah. i would say that you have modeled great mastery in that department that you've been really amazing at being able to do both but one at a time and yes. to to yeah, and to live a life that um, one thing I love about you is that you live a life that you love. So tell us about how your spiritual connection has increased the joy in your life. I And I want to say on that point, though, first, like, I think that it is you have to recognize you can't do all the things all the time. And so I did have to I have a few clients at the moment where. I say to them, you may have to earn less money the next few years while you go through this process. But what I know is that these six years have been like an apprenticeship beyond anything I could have ever studied on the universe and spirituality and healing and awakening. And I know that the work I will do in the world going forward will be so much more potent and powerful because of that. Yeah. So sometimes you've got to be willing to go backwards to go forwards. And Great point. And I, I, and and it's it, that's another piece that's never ending, like that you can't just think one day I'm going to have all my life force and all my power back. Like because oh. once you start awakening, it has it's good and bad, like right? It's that double edged yeah, sword. Totally, it's yeah. That, that it's really hard to be awake and conscious. And it is really powerful. hard, and you have to be really courageous to feel some things that are not so fun to feel. And every time. I know you do it every time I do it, every time I help my clients do it, there is an opening that comes to a greater inner understanding, greater, uh, on many levels, greater peace, and also, you know, accessibility to one's true nature, to yes. compassion and to wisdom and to guidance, all these things that you're talking about. And, and as it comes up, you feel when you're out of alignment. I had a call, client call me this morning. She's in tax week. This is the worst week of her life. It ends in a week. And she's telling me, you know, I'm stressed. I've got this going on. I've got that. I'm thinking about money, blah, blah, blah. And I just said to her, I want you to either visualize or to physically get a box and some post-it notes and to write in seven days, in nine days, in 10 days, like I'm going to think about this. And literally park it because there's times where I, I had to go and be on stage with a thousand people through and, and it might have been the day after I found out that somebody else had been abused sexually as a child in the family system. Now, how do you, what do you do with that level of grief and trauma? But I've got to perform. So there are times when life goes on and you've got to put it in a little box, but you honour that part of you that's coming up. And for her, I said to her, like, it's a really a, a young part that gets scared by money and poverty consciousness. And so we've got to say to that little one, I know that you're afraid right now and that's why you're getting activated. But I do not have the bandwidth right now to go into this deep process, to spend a day in bed crying or whatever it might look like. But I promise you I'm coming back to you. <laughs> and I promise that like seven days from now, and she was like, Two minutes later, she texts me, I'm in the shower, I'm using the tools, I'm washing the day off, I'm putting the music on, I'm shaking things out of my body. And I and she was like, sent, had sent some messages about I'm stupid or how can I be in this again? And I said, after 30 plus years of doing inner work and healing, and I know for you too, Peggy, like we still have this come up, sometimes weekly, sometimes monthly, sometimes yearly, but... <clears throat> It was never done and it is not about bullying yourself it's about finding how do I integrate this into my daily life yes. in a way that as I evolve you know I can continue to work and for me there's been a real balance in that there were times where I felt like I had to surrender like in the moment all the time that I couldn't just park it and I've learned now that I can't that can also be 
a way that you over identify with your trauma and it's like it becomes your full-time job and so learning that balance has become such an important part of my journey so in terms of the joy (laughs) where does the joy I was just gonna say so one of the things I can help you there because one of the things I notice is as the healing happens the healing of the trauma happens that there's more capacities there's more a lot of things and there's more gratitude. And so what are some of the things that you're grateful now that have shifted because you've gone through this, uh, you know, tumultuous time over the last six years? Well, I'm sober. I'm not numbing with food, sex, drugs, and alcohol. I am not self-abandoning. I am not hurting myself physically, emotionally, spiritually. I am able to have friendships and relationships without the needy codependency that vomited out everywhere all the time. I don't have an inner voice that's full of anxiety, um, you know, that follows me around. I'm able to like sit on a yoga mat or meditation mat and sing Katan for two, three hours in the morning and have a deep practice with myself, which is like having this love affair with God and the divine <laughs> and channeling. And <laughs> I'm able to feel that I am not this meat suit, I am energy. And so with all of that, you know, it's that messy middle, right? It's like, I think. And of- also, I think you should mention how proficient of a healer you are. Well, yeah, yeah, I absolutely would not be doing the work I'm doing today. You know, I work with girls kidnapped by the cartel and human trafficked. I work with CEOs with addiction, um, Fortune 500 company owners from every spectrum of life because those foundational roots, what I know is, is you cannot be an amazing leader. And eventually, like myself, no matter how successful you are, everything will collapse and come down at some point when you're supposed to deal with all of this. And, you know, there's this beautiful research that Brené Brown made very famous about when we numb uh, pain and fear, we numb joy. We actually never feel anything fully. And so what I recognize in my own journey is I thought I was living a full life, but I was numbing and um, distracted and busy and being a workaholic. And I didn't know that this level of joy, this capacity was here, but like a butterfly, you have to be willing to go into the cocoon, <laughs> caterpillar. Yeah. I was a caterpillar. And when the trauma hit and the car accident happened, I became goo. You know, they say that the caterpillar literally dissolves and loses all its structure. And can you imagine that experience for a caterpillar? Like, I le- can because I've been through it psychologically. Right. And that for me is what these last six years have been. I became the goo. I went through the pain of that, of not knowing who I am and wondering if I'll ever be out of this. And then rebirthing several times into a butterfly again and again and again. Um, and so... <laughs> That is the joy of it for me, is if you trust that just like a DNA strand intertwined, healing trauma or healing anything in our life, because some people don't identify with the word trauma. Maybe they think that's for big T, but we all have little T. But anything we need to heal in our life where our past is showing up in our present, you know, and and that leads us on an awakening journey. They intertwine as you awaken a little bit and have your ego death. And you heal a little bit more and you become conscious of an old pattern or program. And then you might start your Kundalini or your breath work or your Kirtan. And each process on a practical level that helps you to learn to honor your body, to be safe with yourself, to sit in stillness, to not distract yourself with things that maybe you used before to cope and not feel. And all of that in the end it's like mixing a cake and you come out with your your souffle at the end of joy (laughs) i'm laughing because i'm so tickled by how incredibly articulate you are at at, how gifted you are at speaking about this truth in life about the healing process and about the expansion of the joy and about the unfoldment of who we really are. So, Kirsty, anything else you want to say to our listeners before we go today? Any parting words of wisdom? 
so many things. I think this is just such an enormous, enormous topic, but I hope that I've left them some wisdom drops to give them courage. You know, it takes courage. I would say that the number one thing <clears throat> that comes up again and again with new clients is I am terrified of the tsunami that I will unleash if I dig into and excavate some of this stuff. Yeah. And what I know, you know, I even had a client last week say, oh, am I going to feel better or worse after the we do did a three-hour regression session? And I said, I have yet to have a single client tell me that they don't feel better after because it's such a complete process where yeah. you're creating a corrective experience for these little parts that are maybe lost in the past. And so I would just say to people like, trust that we are built for this. You know, this is our soul's journey. This is what yes. we come here for. So trust that you're built for it. And with that means that you'll be built for it by doing the work. Maybe to be built for it, to be ready, you need some support systems. You need some tools. I was just going to say that. But, I mean, I know you've had guides. I have had I mean, therapists, teachers, helpers, guides, all kinds of things you have as well. And that's the thing about the tsunami is when you're with someone else, they can help manage sort of the onflux of it. They can help you put one toe in and sort of titrate, take that process step by exactly. step. So it doesn't become a complete overwhelming, knock you down, knock you out kind of thing. Absolutely. So, and, and I don't think on the journey, like, I had one of my most severe panic attacks probably 70% of the way through the process. And it was actually you that I called and you were able to talk me through the process. And I that wouldn't have happened in the first year because I wasn't psychologically ready. I think your body gives you what you're ready for as you built the resiliency and the tools and the support. And I knew I was safe to go there with you. And so I think it's trusting yourself yeah. and listening to those guides that, take you on the path and trusting it. It's a process. Yeah. And finding people you feel safe with and people that have been the journey in front of you. You know, that's another thing. One thing yes. that I always look for is has this person entered, have they been through their dark night? Have they entered the chrysalis and completely dissolved? And, you know, did they know what that is? Because yeah. um, as you said, it makes you wiser and it gives you the experience. And I just want to acknowledge that talking to you, I mean, we interviewed about a year ago on my um, authentic uh, summit, I thought just authenticity summit. Um, and between then and now, even you're just so incredibly brilliant, glowing, grounded, intelligent, wise, and, you know, uh, spot on. So thank you for your incredibly, your evolution. Thank you for your evolution. Well, thank you for sharing the journey with me. And thank you for doing this work for so many other people that get to hear this wisdom, because I think, you know, this is the original me too, you know, like, yeah people share because honestly there's so many times that I wanted I wanted a book with an instruction manual because you're driving blind <laughs> when this stuff hits you you don't know where to turn and you don't know who's been through it because not everyone's talking about it and what I found is the more I talked about it and I remember in the beginning you were one of the first people that I did talk about it with and even in our friendship of 15 years and at that point 10 years we had not had some of these conversations. Oh, we had that. And so it's when you are ready and you start opening up, you'd be surprised how many people in your own life are ready to share their own experiences of this stuff. Beautiful. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you. Yeah. So everybody, I hope you reap all the incredible beauty and all of the incredible tips and even watch this again as Kirsty has outlined for you so beautifully about the steps of adversity the steps of <clears throat> going through the healing process and what can open up for you when you do and this expansion of joy and connection to oneself and you're so incredibly authentic and beautiful Kirsty. thank you for being with us today Thank you, Peggy. You're welcome. All right, everybody, stay tuned for next episode. I'll see you there.
Goodbye for now.